I'm the guy that increased his kidney function by over 50 points and even reduced kidney volume after I discovered the effects of a ketogenic diet on polycystic kidney disease way back in 2014. If you want to learn how I did it and how you can do it too, then stay tuned for this video. Hello everyone, this is Felix Mueller, your friendly neighborhood kidney hacker and welcome. You're joining me in episode one of the Reversing PKD podcast, bringing you the best in reversing PKD and improving general health. As this is episode one, fittingly, we're going to talk about the basics. So the basics of what? Well, the basics of reversing polycystic kidney disease. If you're new, you might be asking yourself, um, what did he just say? You can reverse PKD? Well, I mean, um, we got to be a little bit more clear about what reversing actually means. So by definition, reversing means you change the direction, right? Usually you would expect PKD to become worse and worse over time. And we're talking about making it become a little bit better over time. That would be the definition of reversing PKD. Doesn't mean you're going to be cyst free and everything's going to be back to normal in a couple of weeks, but you can probably reverse your disease course. So how does this work? To understand that, we probably need to go a little bit deeper on what is actually happening in PKD. So when you're born, your cells, in most cases, they carry the mutation, right? So most people are actually heterozygous, meaning they have two chromosomes and one of the chromosomes has a mutated version of one of the PKD genes, PKD1, PKD2. And in that case, the body usually expresses, means uses, the version of the gene that's healthy because it's smart enough to do that, right? So now you go through life and things happen, right? You get injured, you get um, hurt by, you know, you, get a, you have an accident, um, you consume something that's injuring your kidney, you get an x-ray, all of these things and many, many more, right? You get a vaccine. All of these things can hurt cells in your body, right? They can injure your cells. So when a cell that needs the PKD gene expresses the right gene, and then it gets an injury that by chance hits the other copy of that same gene, then there's no fallback mechanism, there's no backup copy anymore that the cells can express, right? So in that case, they will start to express the mutated version of the gene, PKD1 or PKD2 gene, they express a protein called PC1 or PC2, polycystin 1, polycystin 2. And they're actually not just used in the kidney, but in all epithelial cells. So all the cells that um, are on the outside of organs, when you get this second mutation, in a cell in the epithelial lining, in this case of the kidney, then you start to get cell proliferation and this fluid secretion that we all hear so much about that is necessary for a cyst to grow, right? So you have this one injured cell and that cell starts to replicate like it's on fire, right? And that is actually the same thing that happens in cancer cells and it's called the Warburg effect. It's named after Otto Warburg, actually a Nobel Prize winner. And he discovered that when cells are in this unlimited mode of growth, proliferation, growth, same thing. Usually, I mean, there's exceptions to this rule, but it doesn't seem there's exceptions in PKD. These cells don't use oxygen anymore. Instead, their energy that they reap from glucose is gained only through glycolysis. And that's what's called aerobic glycolysis, meaning glycolysis in the presence of oxygen. Even though there's oxygen present, we're still doing glycolysis only. So what does that mean? Well, your cells, they make energy, right? In the form of ATP, they use glucose as a substrate, right? You put in the glucose, it's like the fuel in your car, right? 
So when they put in the glucose, usually they first do a step of glycolysis, meaning glycolysis, they sort of dissolve the glucose into something else called pyruvate. And then there's a second step. Pyruvate goes to the mitochondria. Mitochondria are little bacteria-like um, organelles within every cell. And there's thousands of them. Actually, a big part of your body weight is made up of mitochondria. The pyruvate that's ripped from the glucose goes to the mitochondria. The mitochondria take oxygen and they combine it. They do a reaction. And that's what results in a lot of energy. So the first step of glycolysis, step one, gives you two ATP, right? ATP is the energy that the cells need. And the second step, which is the respiration or oxidation, meaning you, you take the pyruvate, you take oxygen and make energy out of that. That step gives you 36 ATP. So it's a whole lot more. It's 18 times more energy, right? Um, a cell that is exhibiting the Warburg effect cannot use the mitochondria to make energy, which means it is constrained to only use glycolysis, can only do the glycolysis step, can't do the step that the mitochondria are for. That means it needs to use 18 times as much substrate, in this case, glucose. That means it jacks up the usage of energy. And through another step that will not go into today in detail, it also increases its growth in the same process because this mode of glycolysis is only possible when you ramp up the growth at the same time. Now we know that PKD cells, once they are injured and by chance they lose the second copy of their PKD gene, so they only have two mutated copies, these cells start expressing the mutated form of the protein. And in that case, they start proliferating, growing too much, right? Then there's the Warburg effect, meaning they can only produce energy in a very inefficient way through aerobic glycolysis. Why do we need to know that, right? There's a way that we can make the cells stop to do this glycolysis, which is the essential building block of this uncontrolled growth. And that is we can give it another substrate. We can give it something else, not glucose, but ketones. What are ketones? Ketones are made out of fat by your body when glucose is not sufficiently available. So when you're fasting, for example, if you're fasting more than 24 hours, depends on how metabolically flexible you are, but after a certain time, you start to make ketones. Ketones are a different energy substrate, and they're very efficient. Actually, you come into the world in ketosis. When you're able to get into ketosis through diet, lifestyle, supplements, then you have this alternative substrate available. And there is research showing, and actually this was clear even before the research was done because there's research on cancer, right, that shows the same thing. When there are ketones available, then the cells that are using the Warburg effect or that are affected by the Warburg effect, they can still metabolize ketones with mitochondrial respiration in many cases. And if they can't and they still get a ketone, after some time, they will have to die, which is also good, right? In PKD, it's both good. Either we can revert the cells back to normal metabolism, meaning they stop growing so much, or, you know, if they just get the ketone, can't use it at all, then they're going to die. And that means also they're going to stop their uncontrolled proliferation. So we know that ketones are basically the key element to improving PKD outcomes. And the next question is, how do you get to a ketogenic state? Well, of course, diet is key. The ketogenic diet has been a big deal in the media and uh, in many, many different places for a long time. And it's a good idea to, you know, do it a couple weeks on end to really get into ketosis and give your body time to adapt. But then it's also important that you interrupt it every now and then so your body doesn't get used to this ketogenic state. You want it to be able to flip 
back and forth, which is associated with the best health outcomes. So what you want is metabolic flexibility. You want to be in ketosis most of the time. I do it six days a week. And then you want to have breaks, days off. You're not going to eat cake or bread or whatever. You should still be adhering to good quality foods, but you need the break. You need the carbs. And if you don't do that, then after some time, you will probably become uh, insulin resistant, which is uh, similar to what happens in diabetes type 2, right? That means over time, you will probably see your fasting blood glucose creep up. So it goes a little bit higher. Um, you want it, you know, in the 80s, low 80s, mid 80s. If you see it going up in the 90s or even over 100, you know there's a problem. Another issue is hormone balance, hormone levels. So uh, when you're in continuous ketosis, we usually see cortisol go up, thyroid hormone go down, testosterone go down. So all of these are not very favorable outcomes and you want to prevent those. In the worst cases, you can even see something like uh, low saliva, low tear production. But uh, in most cases, it's probably going to be um, yeah, hormone issues and blood sugar issues. Not something you want and also not worth it because you're not losing much if you're doing one day a week where you're off keto and on carbs. On those carb days, you really want to go for the carbs. You know, don't restrict. Don't try and uh, make it make it a mid-level carb day. These these days should should really be high carbs. So several hundreds of grams of safe carbs, right? We can go further into food quality a little bit. The diet that I recommend is not just called whatever the ketogenic diet because it doesn't really mean anything. I recommend the bulletproof diet. That's a diet that was coined by Dave Asprey. And this guy really took the time and found all the foods that really sort of hamper human performance, right? And he was one of the first guys to talk about oxalates, uh, oxalic acid, which is a big problem in PKD. So foods like spinach, kale, raspberries, also chocolate sometimes. These foods contain something called oxalic acid, which is a plant defense molecule. And whenever you consume that, um, it binds to calcium. And you can even feel it on your teeth. Uh, for example, if you eat spinach, you can um, chew it. And when you swallow it, you will probably notice that there's a little gritty stuff that is uh, left over, built up on your teeth. The same thing happens within the kidney. And that leads to little tiny calcium crystals that are razor sharp. And they sort of swish around and they cut the kidney tissues in, in very, very tiny ways. These tiny cuts are injury. And when you have injury, you know what happens. You have the chance for mutations. And that is the chance for new cyst growth, which is bad news. So you want to avoid oxalates. And there's also some other anti-nutrients that you want to avoid that are covered by the Bulletproof Diet. You can just download their roadmap, which I will link in the description. And you want to steer mostly towards the green side of the diet. The yellow zones are sort of okay sometimes, and you really don't want to consume anything that's less than yellow, right? That will mostly result in large plates filled with lots of non-starchy vegetables and a good chunk of meat, right? Yes, we are actually getting most of our protein from animal foods. Not just any animal foods, but grass-fed beef and grass-fed lamb. I'll get into that on another episode, but suffice it to say, you want to have adequate protein intake and you want to have it from the most bioavailable sources with the least anti-nutrients, and that is only available in animal protein. Of course, you want to use all those nice non-starchy vegetables to soak up some butter or MCT oil to really get your calories up and get your fat up because we want to be in ketosis, right? We want to be fat adapted and we want to eat a lot of fat. Now I just said MCT oil. Some of you might ask, what is that? MCT oil is an extract of coconut oil. The liver metabolizes it to ketones. It's a great ketone boost. You're probably going to get a boost of 0.6 millimole of ketones when you measure it with a blood meter. A blood meter is basically the most important measuring tool that we have when we start on a ketogenic diet like this. 
because you really want to know what you're doing. You don't just want to guess. Urine tests or saliva tests, breath tests, they're just not accurate. You do have to do the finger prick, even though it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, yeah, we usually recommend Keto Mojo, but there's other brands that work. There's even some continuous ketone meters now, which I am really hoping to do a review on very soon, as soon as I can actually get it to work with my phone. I've tried it, um, doesn't connect. It's unfortunate, but uh, I'll keep you updated when that works. So you want to be on the Bulletproof diet, you want to be in ketosis most of the week, but not every day. And you also, we didn't talk about this yet, want to do intermittent fasting. You've probably heard of this. It's very simple. You just start eating at maybe 1 p.m. You go to 8 p.m. Or you can, you know, switch it around and have it in the morning and stop eating very early. This can be a problem for some people because it's not easy to fast that long. And there's a neat little hack called Bulletproof Coffee. Uh, you probably heard of that one as well. Uh, it means high quality coffee. You want to make it with butter and MCT oil. Uh, you blend it up. It's really nice and creamy. And uh, that is allowed in the fasting window as it's just fat plus it's MCT oil that boosts your ketone production anyway. And that is a super nice boost to your fast. It's going to make you feel a lot less hungry. And that's why I recommend doing it, especially when you're starting out. But I still do it, you know, I've been doing this almost 10 years. And um, I'm still doing Bulletproof Coffee almost every day, maybe every second day if I'm if I'm uh, very, very consistent and I don't feel that hungry in the morning. Now, what have been the results of this? I personally have increased my kidney function over 50 points in total. And my function now at 33 years old is higher than it's ever been. It's higher than it was at my first test, which was at 16 years old. So now I sit at a cool 134 kidney function. Of course, this means my creatinine is very low. Uh, it's actually at the lowest level that is still in range, which in Germany is 0.66. And all this, even though I have increased my meat intake, which goes to show that function is actually improving. And this is not just a result of a lower protein intake, which can look like better kidney function, but is not. It's called the vegan trap or also the lightning bolt effect, which we'll talk about in another video. What tipped me off to this long before all the research had been done on ketosis was actually I was doing the Bulletproof diet and I got note from my nephrologist that my kidney had actually decreased in size. They sent me over to the MRI because they said, you know, ultrasound is not that reliable and we want to be sure. And the MRI confirmed that there was an actual decrease in size. I mean, as far as they can tell, because with cysts, it's always a little bit difficult to say where the kidney begins and where it ends. But to the best of their effort, they were saying it actually decreased in size. And we have seen reports similar to this um, abound in our group which is called Healing Polycystic Kidney Disease Naturally on Facebook as long as we're still allowed on there, which we are, and I'm very grateful that we are. Um, you can also find all the details on how to do it, how to do it right, um, where you find the groups and where you find alternative groups on another network on reversingpkd.com. If you want to learn more about reversing PKD, then I recommend you subscribe to this channel. You will also find some of my other videos on here showing you how to best prepare Bulletproof Coffee, some of the recipes that I've done. And if you want to have some more content, you can actually also join my Patreon, which will give you access to my eight part video series about reversing PKD in daily life and what to do. Follow this channel for more updates. Um, like this video, I would be very happy to get your feedback and comments below. Some requests for new topics that you want me to address would also be great. And for everybody that's listening on a podcast app, thank you so much for listening. Subscribe to this podcast if you are affected by PKD and you want to learn so much more than the doctors will tell you. Until the next episode, happy healing.